Now, here you got this fellow here. He's supposed to be running away, away with the money, but I guess not set up with that. Um, why does fraud occur? Why do people grab the money and run or deceive you? Well, there's a theory that's called the fraud triangle that, that was developed by Guy Kresge in the U.S. in the 50s. Um, and his saying that all three factors, opportunity, pressure, and rationalization has to occur. My feeling is just one has to occur or the person's a paying crook. They don't need any excuse. They don't need ra rationalization. They're just going to take it no matter what. They'll find a way. They'll find the opportunity. And, and they don't need any pressure because they'll find ways to spend the money or stash it somewhere. So if you look at opportunity, basically you put the kid in the candy shop. Not advisable. It's because to me is that one of the key things to lessen the, the risk of fraud is to lessen temptation. Not everybody is going to commit fraud, but, in, but as the temptation gets higher, the chances of someone committing fraud occurs. So one of the key factors is lessen the temptation. You do it through controls. Like even with myself, I've gone to places and we're, we're, we're counting the money, we're trying to figure out what's going on. The person has to leave, they got a call. Oh, just be a half an hour, John. Five minutes, you can stay here. I said, no, you got the key? Take the key, we'll lock the door. I'll stand outside. I don't want to put myself in an awkward position. You don't do that to your staff either. Because if you put your staff in an awkward position, not just a temptation, it could be because it could something that has go wrong, it could be a mistake, someone else may have taken the, the funds before, and you could be accusing an innocent person. So don't put your staff in an awkward position. Pressure. You suddenly get a call from home. Your, your mother um, is ill. She needs immediately tr uh, treatment to be flown to Vancouver because there's a long wait list in v Victoria, and she needs $5,000. She needs a treatment. You say, my goodness, next day you go to work, you're counting the money, and there's some fun sitting there. Temptation. Opportunity, but you got the pressure. Or you look for a way. How can I get the money? Rationalization. Quite often, I, I, I think this is uh, quite common in the sense is that People don't think they've done anything wrong. They're getting what they're due. Small business, you have a few key employees, you grow together, you work together. Suddenly you start to enjoy the benefit. You start to take the time off. Start to enjoy life. You're taking the trip, just spending it, you got the fine wines, you, stop, you, you step in every now and then. And lo and behold, the employee is standing there, gee, John's really enjoying life now. Remember those days we used to sweat and every time, oh yeah, remember those days you used to sweat, John will say. Yeah, I'm still gecking my 30 grand a year and he's now earning f you know, 500 grand and got his big yacht. What about me? Well, I'm gonna get my fair share. So again, you're exposing yourself. Try to avoid that. And we mentioned the uh, playing crook before. One interesting, you know, again, statistics sometimes you have to be careful of, but one interesting thing that came out of the, the, uh, the report to the, to the, to the nations is tips. And, it's, and tips is a, the way how fraud is detected is number one, 33%. Accident is 12%. So almost 50% of fraud is detected by either accident or by tips. And in small business, they say, yeah, but we don't have internal control. We don't have much external audit. But even in bigger businesses, tips and accidents are near the top of the list. Audits is not that significant even in bigger businesses for finding fraud. So the tips, and I can remember one scenario which, which I had, was that suddenly uh, one of my staff came to me and said, John, can, uh, can I talk to you? Sure. He um, says, I don't know how to say this. I've known about it for two months, and I really feel bad about it, but my, but, but, but my brother is stealing from you. I said, oh. Told me everything, but he says, but I don't want him to know that I'm squealing on him. But I said, why are you doing this? Well, you've treated the staff right. You've done things, etc. So they felt the trust to come to me to be able to give the tips. But so you have to, so, so to me, it's important to have that avenue open. 
So now that we know all the risks that, that, that you face and all the danger, it comes down to how can you manage fraud, fraud risk without going broke? Remember cost benefit? That's important. So as I noted before, don't subject people to, to, uh, to temptation. Don't dangle that money um, in front of them, both physically and mentally. Mentally is a sense, don't give them the pressure. Try to have programs uh, like larger companies do in the terms of they think uh, be able, able to address personal issues of staff. Try to fill other uh, aspects of the staff besides just money. Trust through checks and balances. You've got to have a trusting environment. I do not deny that. But you've got to do it with the checks and balances in place, subtly that they're there, not, uh, and that people know what's right and wrong. And the key thing, I think, of course, is hire and treat staff right. And so now, like, how do you do that? HR, to me, which is a human factor, human resource factor, HR and accounting does have to blend together. Counting, they say, is about numbers, but it does impact humans. We impact the people, and you cannot isolate it from the human resource area. For example, it's surprising the number of people who don't check references. Even today, companies are not being, uh, references aren't being checked, reviewing the, uh, uh, the resumes. And for example, is that what I always do is I look at resume and I look for gaps, gaps in employment. Gee, you took six months here. Oh, I went to Japan. Oh, you did. Um, which city did you go to? Uh, um, um, right? So try to follow it up. Or they say they worked, they started this place uh, till September 2009. You call the place? No, he left me in July. Where are those other three months? So ask the right questions. Uh, and do keep in mind that you say, you know, people don't give, uh, very seldom do people give bad references. Job descriptions and training. Make sure that you're hiring the right person for the right job, that they're trained, that they're not exposed is that you just don't throw people in, even if you're a small business, two, three hours training, a week training, if it's required, you're gonna end up with more productivity, a more confident staff. We cannot ignore those, uh, those factors. And remuneration, I say, consider the qualitative and quantitative. If you underpay compared to everyone else, to me, you know, um, you know, you're really exposing yourself. So you've got to be at least competitive when you hire staff. And the qualitative may be tough for a small business, but the, but the chamber, for example, does have programs along that lines to, to make it more cost effective for, cost for small businesses to have health programs and medical. Uh, medical um, uh, monitoring and feedback. Monitor your staff. Give them the appropriate feedback constructively, positively and even-handed, and that's one area that I always had, had, had difficulty with, trying to be even-handed with your staff. You know, the favorite routine you've got to be careful of because you can alienate other staff. But it's human factor, oh, someone's working hard, and oh, you're really, and, and you start to give them more benefits or you're just pure personality reasons. Inevitably, you will upset someone else. So you could be exposing yourself, you can even lose a better staff that way, or exposing yourself to fraud risk. I think overall, not just with the temptation, the other key factor is minimize the, the, the rationalizations. So uh, avoid the temptations or can, and minimize the, the rationalizations are probably two of the key advices in fraud risk management from the human resource side. Simple steps. So simple steps here we gain being proactive. Governance. Leadership from the shop, I mean from, from, from the top. The reason I said shop is that when I really think of leadership from the shop, uh, from, from the top, so as a kid, my father always used to, in the stores, he used to go get the goods, he'd walk to the till, have the staff take the discount, 10% like everybody else, exactly the same, he'd pull out the money and he'd pay for it. He didn't want everything that, he's paying for everything just like everyone one else is. If I want a candy bar, if I didn't have the money in my pocket, I didn't get it. So leadership, I'm, I know I'm simplifying it, but you've got to set the tone. 
If you don't set the example, how can you expect your staff to? Management buy-in and also staff buy-in. Policies and procedures. We identified particular frauds before. Consider the possible fraud. Awareness, because remember, it's not just with the staff you're concerned about. You've got your vendors. You've got your customers. Your staff has to be trained to identify pot potential issues that may occur, the expense, and uh, the, the exposure you may have. And that's good from your perspective because if they can save you funds and money from being hit by fraud, then it will go to the bottom line. Hopefully, they will get a greater reward. The human factor, which I always say that you must focus on, staff and vendors recognize the different people. Monitoring. You monitor the situation, c c communicate, let people know as to what the policies are. And talking of policies, well, one thing, I, as I said, I don't believe that you say, here's my fraud policy, right? This is what it is, we're going to tackle fraud. No, you've got to integrate it. You have to integrate it with your other policies and procedures. Just like you say that we do not accept sexual harassment, we do not accept racial harassment, we also do not accept fraud. It's along the same line. You're not setting it apart. It's one of the do nots, and you deal with it, and you help the staff to identify it. You have a procedure and policy in place. If they know that something happens, what do they do? Well, you just say, call me, and then you're too busy to address it. I, I want to talk to you, Mr. Rankin. Well, how about tomorrow? And tomorrow, they, they may quit because you're not there to address their concern. How do you deal with it? You know, what to do and not to do. Because, as I said, if a fraud issue occurs, you do it with the, with the wrong way, you can end up being in a lawsuit, or you can lose the, uh, the evidence or it may not be admissible. You have to know what procedures to follow.